Hi, and welcome back to Viewed.dev Day 2. I'm Thomas Ford, the head of communications here at Viewed, and I have the pleasure of being your host today. Let's get started. As everyone knows, software developers need more than just technical skills. In this talk, Viewed's head of core engineering, Michal Lech, shares the single best asset class for software developers to invest in. And now, over to you, Michal. Welcome, my name is Michal and I've been at Viewed more than 10 years. During that time, I've worked as an engineer, project manager and team manager. Nowadays, I work as head of the native products department. And today, I've prepared a small riddle for you. Are you ready? Here we go. Which asset, in your opinion, has potentially the highest rate of return? Could it be gold? How about oil? Have you considered stocks? Real estate? Well, maybe crypto. Well, these are all potentially interesting assets, but right now, I mean some special one. The one that has a potentially infinite rate of return. It has some special, unique properties. On the one hand, it can act as if it has some time machine capabilities. On the other hand, it can multiply and multiply the results it can deliver. Alright, so any ideas? Three, two, one. Well, obviously, it's you, each and every one of you. Most likely, you have already noticed that investing in yourself is extremely important and it's basically worth your time doing it. And by attending our today's conference and learning new stuff, you are showing that awareness in practice. But I wonder if you have fully realized how crucial investing in yourself really is. Or if you see how it brings this infinite rate of return that I have just mentioned. So let's see where this time machine effect is and where this multiplication kicks in in practice. Let's start with this time machine effect. Imagine you have some particular skill set, which you use to execute a particular task. In practice, you require a fixed amount of time to finish it with your current skill set. As a next step, imagine you either improve your current skills or learn something new that is apl applicable to the task at hand. So now you have a wider skill set. And for the same task, you will either need less time or you will execute it better, or both. As a result, you freed up extra time that you can decide what to do with. So here we have this time machine effect generating extra time that is available for you as soon as you learn something new. Pretty amazing and simple, right? Okay, let's now focus for a moment on this second angle, multiplication phenomena. Usually, when you learn a new skill, it's because you want to solve some particular pr problem. So you learn it and you solve the problem done. But then you can quickly find yourself using such a new skill to also solve other problems. Quite often it's useful for topics that you would have not thought about when learning it. So in practice, you learn a new skill once and then you apply it to all sorts of the problems moving forward. Here the results of your single investment into a new skill is multiplied each time you use it. Alright, I hope we can agree now that investing in yourself can bring really amazing results. But here comes the next question. What skills in particular are worth investing in? Right now we are attending a technical conference viewed.dev. That implies to me you are aware that investing in technical skills is important. So I won't go that path right now. Instead, let me emphasize a different side of the coin, non-technical soft skills that, in my opinion, are worth investing in by engineers. Well, obviously by everybody. So I've selected four such skills. By no means, it is an exhaustive list. On the other hand, I will focus on the ones that truly help both my career and my private life. Additionally, I will try to briefly explain why I consider these skills important for every engineer plus share some ideas how you could try to develop each one of them. And just remember, the key is not only getting theoretical knowledge, but more importantly, using it in practice. So let's go into a bit more details. Skill number one, building relationships. 
This is a key factor to pretty much all aspects of our life, including engineering work. During software development, we need to co cooperate with many other people inside and outside of our teams. Things go much more smoothly if you are able to build relationships with others. The tricky part might be that we engineers are on average introverts, so it can be somewhat challenging for us. But no worries, learning how to build basic relationships with others is not rocket science. So how to do it? Let me recommend a timeless classic, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. When you read it, try to apply it in your daily life and check out the results yourself. Skill number two, communication. That's an interesting one. On the one hand, everybody seems to be aware that communication is key. On the other hand, I observe that miscommunication is a part of our daily life anyway. And if you were to ask me what are the most important factors of a successful project, then communication would definitely be among them. So how to learn it? Well, personally, I learned it the most during the marriage preparation course. Yes, I also think this is a wise move if you are considering marriage, although that's a separate story. Most likely, the easiest way nowadays to improve your communication skills is to attend a course focused on this area and then remember to apply gained knowledge in your daily life. Skill number three, public speaking. Ah, Michal, are you sure? That feels like going too far from the engineer perspective. Well, yes and no. If you think about it longer, I think it's possible to see situations in a daily engineer work routines that public speaking skills are really useful. Think about status meetings. Think about situations when you present your ideas to other team members and you want to put it in a well-structured and compelling way. Or if you happen to cooperate directly with customers. So how to learn it? The simplest idea is probably to join some dedicated course. Just remember to use such knowledge in practice. It is said Winston Churchill, one of the great orators of our time, would practice each speech carefully, writing it out before he began. And if you would like to go a bit further, you can also consider joining specialized clubs that will help you learn and train such skills in practice. One such organization is Toastmasters, and probably there are many more. Skill number four, last but not least, learning foreign languages. Imagine you know how to build relationships, how to communicate efficiently, or how to present your ideas in front of others. But if you speak only one language, you end up with somewhat limited audience. For me, learning foreign languages is a way to scale relationships beyond my backyard and increase opportunities to share ideas with many more people. Definitely a pleasant experience. And let's be frank, in our engineer's case, working in software development, learning at least English is a must. How to do it? There are many different options and probably you need to try out a few and select the one that is most suitable for you. But from what I observe, working quite efficiently is to first focus on vocabulary in order to start conversations with native speakers as soon as possible. Grammar and everything else comes as the next steps. All right, that's my quick view on the soft skills that are worth learning by engineers. Plus a few very initial tips on how to start. It's now your move. Good luck in investing in yourself. And now it's time for more technical sessions from our great engineers. Cheers. Thanks, Michal, for giving us the one true investment tip that's guaranteed to give a positive return. We're going to go right now back to the hard tech skills and present a cookbook for investigating issues in embedded apps. In this talk, viewed engineer Michal Wojciechowski takes us through his process of troubleshooting issues in the tricky world of embedded applications. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, hello and welcome, everyone. Today's topic is about investigating issues. I am Michał. I'm working with embedded programs for about 15 years now. And for the last five years, I'm working with Vue, mostly on porting our media stack on various platforms. 
I'm designing the overall architecture, but also diving deep into any problems that pop up from various sites. And I will be talking about uh, some good practices when encountering such issues. So there are two parts of today's talk. One is about how to organize your work in general and how to even approach analyzing issues. Uh, in the second part, I will add a few hints on what is helpful to have in your architecture to speed up issue analysis. Why do I even need to talk about this stuff? Well, I'm actually seeing people struggling with this area every day. How we should approach not just basic crashes, but some more nuanced problems. The ones that silently prevent the program from doing, uh, from working as it should. Those where you don't immediately see why the program is doing something wrong or where the wrongdoing could be happening. <laughs> Does it sound familiar? If you often fight with problems like that, you and your company or team, you might have stumbled upon various inefficiencies of that process. It often feels really chaotic or with unpredictable results. Investigations that should be just going forward are instead stuck or being tossed between teams. And I will try to bring some structure into this chaos. It helps to have some ground rules that might speed up the process and make it more predictable. Over the years, I found that there are less and less situations where I don't know what to do or which direction to take next. It might help to simply have more experience in my field, but I think that's not exactly the reason. I actually feel confidence in the approach I'm taking every day that I've worked over the years. And I have a few topics today to share my experience with you. Just to be able to better visualize and have a better feeling of what problems I'm gonna be talking about, this is an example software stack. It consists of several modules, each responsible for different functionality or different abstraction level of the same functionality. It is, of course, very simplified. And the assumption is that between some of those layers, there will be well-defined APIs. This schematic does not need to represent a cold stack. The modules can just as well be located on different servers and communicating asynchronously through some IPC. Note that I am mostly focusing on video playback nowadays, so most of my examples will be from video playback. So you have an application and there is something wrong in how it works. Someone reported a problem that seems difficult to approach. The problem could be reported by your customer or your QA team running some test scenarios or just your fellow developers. And you were given the task of investigating it and I'm not saying fixing it or solving it, because at this stage, we don't even know where the problem might be lurking. And after gathering some basic information, the problem might just as well be redirected to someone else entirely. So what should we do at the very beginning? Someone needs to catch the problem when it appears. And that is often difficult enough by itself. The software your team is developing can be an any shape at the time with new issues introduced every other day and your experience might be subtly affected by those other problems. The problematic effects you'll be seeing are probably not the problem itself, but some after effects of that problem. And those effects might be visible like five layers from the problem that created those effects. And that leads to a situation where it is very often disputable if what we are experiencing is the problem or maybe some other problem, or maybe something that we should ignore for now at least. For example, let's say the problem is underspecified. The customer sends a recording with a problem. We can see that video playback is just black. We assume that there is some problem with video displaying and we start thinking of scenarios that could cause this. But actually, there was a problem with network connectivity and the video was simply not loaded at all. And the customer actually knows it. They just forgot to mention that. But an opposite situation also tends to happen. The customer did not notice the problem with the network. Instead, they are stating that the video is not showing properly or there is a problem with video positioning. In both cases, it is vital to start with aligning your assumptions by plainly asking, 
Can you confirm that you see that the video data is loaded to the display engine and that the only problem is with displaying the data? After that, the customer for saying, yeah, we confirm, they will probably say, we didn't check this. And you just saved yourself a lot of investigation effort. So a pro tip from me, check if all involved parties like yourself, your fellow coworkers, the customer and end user truly understand what the issue is about. Not why there is a problem, most likely nobody knows at this point, but why they think current behavior is incorrect or unwanted. This immediately leads to insights about the way of testing and reproduction that they use. Other important factors they missed to tell you. But note, and this is important, the aim is not to disprove that the problem exists. And it is not to discourage people from reporting issues. So it's super important to act friendly and supportive, even when we need to challenge what someone is claiming. But usually, we don't have any clue on where a problem might originate. Initially, it could be anywhere. So at the beginning, the aim is to narrow down the investigation, excluding factors that seem to have no relation to reproducibility of the issue. We can now ask various questions to better understand the context of the issue. And we should do that before diving into the code or trying to guess where the problem is. The first step is to take a very high level look on the problem and try to gather some basic clues about when the problem is happening. So actions, for example, playing video, then pausing and unpausing several times, or maybe changing tracks or languages or some other settings. Input data, by this, I mean anything that is delivered externally. For example, playing a video from a URL, that's an input data. Loading a DRM license from a server, that requires some URL or JSON or XML or binary blob. Next, what build version was used, what uh, libraries or modules were enabled, if that's an option. For example, swapping a software module or hardware platform and retesting might show a different behavior. Then, timing of the reproduction. What software is used, so when it was built, from which sources, but also when it was being run for the problem to appear, like since three days ago, or at some peak hour only when the network might be busy. Such high level look is very good as an initial investigation, mostly because it can be done by someone that's not familiar with inner workings of the software stack. So we can use that approach to share the burden of the work with the customer, especially if the problem appears only in their setup, your QA team, or even automate such checks on a nightly basis. Of course, not everything can be tracked with a high level checking. For example, we can track that the problem reproduces after some modification to media parser module and blame that module and that patch. But that is often misleading a such change can only trigger a different behavior in video decoder module, which was actually buggy. Uh, another example is when we have a lot of data processing in various modules. At each step, each module processing the data is making some decisions that influence what other modules are receiving. If at the end the data is incorrect, there is no way to easily tell which step was faulty. Also, High-level investigations can only provide you with some information, but the more you confront them, the less is your return. Will anyone even have the time to draw any conclusions from lots of different high-level experiments, like rerunning with different data or configuration? Usually, after two or three runs with different setup, anything more is just a noise. The work spent on reruns is no longer productive. An engineer doing the analysis won't have time to like read the logs from all those runs. So a pro tip, make about one or two reruns of the reproduction with different configurations like different hardware or older build. Anything more is often a waste of time. But 
if you feel that certain high-level experiments can lead to immediate narrowing of the investigation, by all means, do it. For example, gradually disabling modules or replacing them with mock ones and rerunning. If you don't have any more ideas on how to narrow the problem, you should switch to other, more direct methods of investigating. If the problem has been detected by the program itself, you should already have a nice starting point to do your investigation. There are some caveats though. If there is any module that first reported some problem, start with that module. Other layers or modules might just propagate the error, so it's vital to find the first reporter. That will be the place that actually looked at some data or parameters or state and made that decision that this is an erroneous situation. This might sound a bit obvious, but from my experience, it is not. I myself often fixate on a problem that I just noticed in the logs or one that just looks like a match for my problem and then investigate from a wrong angle. While the key is to follow some organized approach. And now uh, I have an example. Let's see if you can guess where the catch is. We have a player application and a video content that has four audio tracks, each track with different requirements, for example, a different audio codec. And the player application is trying each audio track in turn, checking if the track is supported or not. And it turns out that for each codec, the decoder module returned not supported. But we do know that something should be supported, for example, because it was supported in the past. So the audio track could not be set up, the player application logs an error and fails. Now, what is wrong with this scenario? The most troublesome obstacle is that there is no visible failure point, because each codec is allowed to fail and such failure is not treated as an error. So there is no first error, at least it's not easy to find without inspecting all the paths for all the codecs and checking with some documentation on which codecs should have been supported. My recommendation in such cases is to make the logic less dynamic and with more settings being hard-coded or at least hard-configured, so the program could be more self-aware of what failure is expected and what should be reported as an error. And here's a quick note. If a module or a piece of code is not properly explaining why it reported an error, like with a log message or at least a code comment, then it's best to complain to that code maintainer right away. For example, if a test case only reports success or failure, with no explanation of what exactly it thinks is incorrect. Then we need to analyze that code first, find out what it was trying to do and what that code decided is incorrect. That code then becomes part of the problem and not a solution. Next thing that I advise is catching incorrect behavior at one specific API level. Let's call it a API trap. We expect to catch like incorrect value or incorrect call order or lack of some call. The goal is to find a good place to start your analysis, expecting to maybe find some irregular behavior there. Your feedback can be logs or traces or GDB inspection, basically any method to observe what a particular module is doing. We can observe the entire module, but that is usually impractical. Most often there is a well-specified API on the border of two or more modules, and it's easiest to tell if that API is being used correctly or not. But where to start looking? If there are multiple layers in your application and initially we have no idea where the problem might lie, we can choose one layer or one API and start the observations there. For example, so com some commands or data packets are flowing through those layers and we could observe them and decide if they are what we expect. Most often, you will not be an expert in all the modules, layers and APIs in your application or ecosystem. 
So how can you investigate the parts you know very little about? And the short answer is, you can't. And yes, I'm very often feeling just like our friend here. There are some approaches to remedy this, however. You can take the time and actually learn something about such an API, be it documentation or design documents or from seeing in action how that API behaves, if you have proper logs and can run various scenarios. And last but not least, ask your coworkers to provide you a quick overview of the API. This might sound like a huge time sink, and it is. This can take a lot of time, and if you need to do that for every API you encounter, it becomes impractical. What else can be done then? You can try to delegate the problem to someone else entirely. If you can reasonably claim that that someone knows the area better than you. Most of your danger is that the problem can ping pong between various people where nobody is interested in pushing it forward and nobody feeling responsible for making it happen. If it's too easy to argue that you are not the best person for the job, people will be doing it just to get out of unwanted tasks. So how to prevent that? One alternative approach is to choose another API that you do know and investigate there instead. So if layer A is hard to investigate for you, choose layer B that operates nearby, like one layer above or below. This is a common way to narrow down the investigation. Inspect the code flow at layer B, conclude that there is some irregular behavior coming from layer A, like calls, events, callbacks, parameters, or call timings, go to owner of layer A with the findings. They will be more inclined to look into it now that the problem seems closer to layer A. The another API can really be anything you feel comfortable with, like UI only, just report what incorrect you can see there. JavaScript application only, read JavaScript code, understand what it tries to do, Check if anything that the browser response is suspicious. Top level application logic, read and understand it. Then check if any behavior from underlying libraries is suspicious. The goal of such approach is to investigate the problem in an efficient manner. Make sure that your part of the investigation brings some value to the team, like some new information or clarification, for example, this application or test tries to do this or that. Or narrowing of scope. For example, this layer works fine or this layer looks fishy. You don't need to solve the problem by yourself. But there needs to be a feeling that you drive the problem towards a solution. In some cases, the application you are working with feels like it's actively preventing you from solving your issue, like when you cannot get any useful logs, or when the application is too large, too complex, or when your APIs don't allow for spotting irregularities. Maybe the APIs are too complex or too permissive, meaning that too many different flows are allowed. Then it might be a high time to do some changes to the application itself. Otherwise, no amount of good approaches is going to help with the issues piling up. Logging always helps, and I have yet to see a case where it's harmful. And yet, I've worked with many professional modules that have almost no logging whatsoever. Such module is working pretty well until it doesn't, and then a lack of logging becomes immediately apparent. Searching for any problem in often involves adding logs manually and recompiling a lot, so I definitely do not recommend this. Even if you think a particular module is complete and has no issues, adding logs there will help understand what other modules around it are doing and the flow of the entire application. So it's not just for the bugging of this particular module. In some cases, the program processes larger chunks of data, larger that, than could be logged, at least. For example, 
10 kilobytes of some XML or one encoded video or audio frame. Being unable to look at the data is a very annoying showstopper. I can often see people guessing that the problem could be related to data being invalid or unsupported, but with no way to confirm it. With the data in hand, you can simply pass the investigation to people who might confirm it. But if you cannot present such data to them, they will need to acquire it by themselves, which can be very impractical for someone that's not in your project. Presenting a ready-to-be-analyzed data to someone will get people's attention and increase the priority of investigating your issue. If you keep well-defined APIs between your modules, it should be trivial to swap any module to another, simpler version of it, like a stab or fake version. One important thing when creating such a mo fake module is to make sure it's much, much simpler in implementation than the original module. The point is to be able to safely assume that the fake module is not problematic. For example, to assume that it doesn't cause memory leaks or that it's not super slow, then if some problem is still reproducing, we can safely assume that the problem is not in the replaced module. Um, a real life example, Recently, I tried to check if a hardware decoder module is the cause of a problem. So I decided to implement a software decoder based off on FFmpeg and do the testing with it. And the result was the problem was still reproducible. So I wanted to assume that the decoding wasn't the problem, but the FFmpeg based module was still a complicated chunk of code so I couldn't easily tell that it wasn't causing any problems. What I ended up doing is creating a fake decoder module that was just drawing some colors on a bitmap, and it was finally straightforward enough that I could just tell that decoding wasn't problematic. Allow each low-level module to be run and tested separately. Sometimes a module needs some lower level modules as well, and that's acceptable too. For example, video decoding might need video displaying as well. The goal is to eliminate all high level modules from the equation, not change them into stubs, but to drop them completely. There are some design problems preventing this approach, like the only way to test a module is to run the whole thing, or the module's API is so complex that it needs another controller module on top. In the, if that's the case, you need to work a bit more on your architecture. Next, if a problem only reproduces with some very specific steps, which is usually the case, then forcing those steps to be exact every single time can be nearly impossible, if you have lots of layers in the way. For example, user clicking seek 30 seconds forward at the right time, or data chunk has finished downloading at just the right time. That's a lot of variance that we have no good way to eliminate. So running the whole application each time is often not the best choice. Their production can be sparse and highly dependent on external factors, like network conditions or timings of other modules. If we reduce the amount of layers from test logic to actual execution in the module that interests you, we can eliminate lots of this variance that all those layers are introducing. But to do that, we need to be able to find out what API calls are made on some low-level module X here, when the problem is reproduced. This approach really shines when reproduction is hard or can only be done in a setup that is hard to access. Then we could force those exact conditions anytime we want. If we have access to all the tools I mentioned before, like dumping data and module separation. For example, downloading DRM license fails when running the whole application. We can pick the exact DRM request body, like some XML blob. Then run the lowest level code you can with that XML blob. Reproduction, 100%. And the steps can be stored for later to be rechecked, even automatically, each night. 
If the problem is sensitive to timings or delays, you can try to make it go away by tweaking those timings. I often see that such tweaking can reduce, reduce the problem reproduction, for example, from 10% to just 1%, or even something that can seem like 0%. But is that a win? Probably the problem will just resurface after a while. Instead, we can tweak the timings so that the problem appears even more, up to 100% ideally. For example, opening video decoder sometimes blocks for a few milliseconds longer than usual. This triggers some hard to trace race condition in other layers. We can add an extra 100 millisecond delay in the video decoder blocking function. And this makes the problem more apparent and much easier to reproduce and to find those races in the other layers. And that's about it from my side today. Quick summary of all that I mentioned. Don't hesitate to ask for clarifications as wrong assumptions could be deadly. Don't overdo information gathering or you won't be able to analyze it all. Methodically track down the root issue of the problem. Jumping to the conclusions early is rarely efficient in the end. And if you want to pass the problem to someone else, provide them with some value first or you will be ignored. And the tools I recommend using, lots of logs at API level, using thin APIs if possible. Narrowing the reproduction should be your priority. And this is best done with swapping complex modules for simpler ones. So it's best to design your code with that in mind from the very beginning of designing your application. So thank you very much for listening and see you soon. Thank you, Michal. And now let's go to some of the questions. And I think I think one of the first questions here, uh, first from my perspective, is uh, you say breaking the app. Uh, is that is that really a solid investigation method? Yeah, you can call it breaking the app. Um, so the idea is to make one module behave uh, as badly and as poorly as possible and just check how other modules in the application will react to that. So uh, in this way, you can test corner cases uh, in a more forceful way, not rely on uh, randomness or accidental discovery of corner cases, but make them more, uh, more um, predictable to be tested on. So you can, for example, increase some kind of delay or or increase the size of your data just to make it harder for the entire application to work on that data. And this could trigger some uh, hard uh, or rare corner cases in your application. So, so this is perfectly valid. Great, thank you. And, and you also mentioned that we need to uh, hard code more. How can hard coding anything really be better than than automatically detecting something <laughs> yeah I, I knew this was gonna be a bit controversial so the idea is if you have um, different hardware configurations on and your application needs to run on a variety of different hardware platforms or, or configurations um, then uh, it's normal for different hardware to have different features for example some uh, platforms will support higher video resolutions or different set of codecs or different streaming protocols. And your application or website must be able to handle all those cases, all those devices uh, gracefully without like complaining that some resolution is not supported by a device. So 
um, the application must be able to query the device about its supported features. And then, for example, if uh, a device does not support most uh, the newest streaming protocol or the highest video resolution, uh, the application can fall back to using lower resolution. And uh, with that approach, this is pretty normal, and this is a standard across the industry, but with that approach, it is very easy to miss uh, when the device does not support something that it should. Hmm. The application never complains. It just falls back to something that is supported. So from both the developer and QA point of view and from the end user point of view, those kind of issues can uh, become really transparent and unnoticed. And so the idea is that at some point, during the development cycle, we, as the developers, QAs, and designers, need to be able to, um, to force our expectations on uh, the given device. For example, uh, provide a configuration file uh, that uh, states what should be supported and what should be disabled just for the testing phase, for example. For example, if you want to test uh, the highest possible resolution, like 4K resolution of video mm -hmm. streaming, we need to be able to disable all the software uh, decoding fallbacks or lower resolutions or the streaming protocols that we don't want to test right now. So the application has, for example, just one choice, just test the setup that we want to test right now. And this is what I call like hard configuring. It's not necessarily for the lifetime of the application, it can be just for testing. But uh, we need to have this uh, possibility in our application. Excellent. Uh, wow, thanks. That was a, that was a great answer. Um, and then I just want to ask one more uh, question, and that's, uh, you know, I thought you mentioned adding logs a lot, and I thought logs or sort of adding logs all over the code was kind of a thing of the past, but you seem to disagree. Can you, can you tell me more about that? Uh, yeah, um, adding logs is really, a, an old school technique, you can say that, but uh, um, I'm also excited for the brand new thing that will uh, make adding the logs obsolete and uh, will take us to the next level in application debugging and investigating. But for now, I don't think there is uh, such a silver bullet uh, for that. And especially for embedded applications where uh, timing and uh, running in real time is critical for many functionalities like video playback or smooth video playback. Uh, I don't think we have uh, a possibility to, for example, stop an application and uh, connect it to a debugger and see what's going on. And so uh, a cheaper method of investigating and gathering information like uh, emitting logs, a lot of logs to be um, analyzed later on mm -hmm. offline or by someone else is always a win in that situation, especially on a bed. Great. Um, I want to also, we received a question in the comments first uh, from Hubert says, great presentation, Michal. So kudos to you for a great presentation. And thanks for all your great answers as well to my questions. But uh, Hubert also has uh, a question. Uh, first, he says, you mentioned logs and swapping modules. What about enabling core dumps? Do you recommend any specific framework such as BrakePad, CrashPad, or backward CPP? Yeah, uh, about uh, core dumps. Um, actually, in my experience over the recent years, um, using core dumps in a, an application that is really large can often be just impossible due to memory constraints. And uh, so um, we don't use it in our current setup, at least in Vue, just because the browser is so vast that uh, we can all, all only use it like for when testing on uh, in emulated environments. So, so it's, uh, it can definitely happen uh, during local testing, but on the device, um, I wouldn't recommend this unless mm. you have some uh, specific setup that works for you then, of course. 
but uh, uh, going back to your original question, uh, I, I couldn't recommend any, any over the other. Excellent. And, and Hubert also asks if you use any particular framework for tracing calls. Um, currently, we are heavily relying on Chromium as our base of uh, our application, and it consists like of 90% of our entire code base. So it's pretty natural that we uh, follow that framework that they use. Um, so uh, even introducing some other framework in whatever uh, we would like to use um, uh, in our, our application just wouldn't uh, work because we already have a framework from Chromium. Got it. Thanks for that. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions from from the chat. I don't believe we do. So I think, uh, yeah, if we don't have another one come in, then I think I just simply want to say thank you, Mikhail, for answering all of the questions and for putting together such a great presentation. Thank you. Excellent. And I believe that concludes Mikhail's session on troubleshooting embedded apps. Make sure you stay tuned for our next session, which is all about using Clang uh, in embedded Linux environments. It's going to start right here at 11 a.m. on Vue.dev. We'll see you then. Welcome back to Vue.dev. In this talk, Vue developer Pyotr Tvorek talks about Linux tool chains and shares how Vue turned to a solution involving Clang. Don't forget to ask your questions in the chat. Now, over to you, Pyotr. Thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. As mentioned, my name is Pyotr Tvorek. I'm currently employed as a software developer at Vue. And today, I'd like to talk to you about using Clang in embedded Linux world. This presentation will talk you, take you to a certain path. First, I would like to tell you a few words about the project I work on. This should hopefully give you a bit of context and understand why certain decisions um, have had to be made in our case. Second, why we actually decide, decided to deploy a custom compiler in our setup. Then, why was a Clang deemed to be a better on options? Then I'll tell you a bit about our results. And finally, we might actually have a short Q&A session. So, what is an embedded Linux device, you may ask? In our case, it's an TV or STB that you usually might find in your living room. Hardware-wise, it's probably similar to something like your five-year-old Android phone. So, maybe ARM or x86 CPU, in rarer, in rarer cases MIPS, probably some one or two gigabytes of RAM memory and some slow flash, uh, flash storage. Where our devices differ from the uh, Android uh, TVs is that they have much bigger screens. So, the project I currently work on is called Viewed Core. It's basically a Chromium web engine package for your TV or a set-top box. If you know Chromium, you probably one thing that you probably know it's not a small project. So before preparing this presentation, I did a quick git grab and checked the number of lines of code that Chromium repository has, and it showed almost 42 millions. On top of that, we added almost 2 million lines of code ourselves. This whole code base is built into an SDK, so a shared library and uh, accompanying headers that we sh ship to our customers and partners. If you think about all this code, it's probably not strange to understand to, um, that this actually generates a lot of binary code. In our case, it's almost 100 megabytes of various libraries and 
components that we need to load into memory. Besides that, it's probably also not hard to guess that it takes a lot of time to build all of this. What this all means is that given our older hardware and the amount of code you used to build, is that compiler optimizations are really, really important for us. So, how do you actually build all this code? Well, not that, it's not that different from uh, many other platforms, like for example Android. When you wish to build C or C++ code for it, you basically need a toolchain. In our case, it's basically something that we usually call a vendor toolchain, because it's actually delivered by various uh, platform vendors, like for example Broadcom, Mediatek or Mstar. Typical toolchain is built from components you probably know, like C++ compiler, C compiler, linker, assemble, assembler or some on for various tools like Redel for. Besides the tools, you also have various libraries that allow you to use the platform. Most of the tools come from the GNU project. GNU project, as you probably know, is an open source project. In our case, the main problem that we suffer in, uh, that, that we have to deal with when, can we, when it comes to vendor toolchains is that they can be sometimes considered an open source museum. So it's not that strange to actually use seven year old compiler in production nowadays. What is also quite, uh, quite problematic is that each vendor toolchain is different. Even most vendors, even though most vendors ship GCC, they usually decide to actually de deploy different versions of GCC containing different patches and different configurations. Another problem we often have to deal with is that some vendors <coughs> still insist, insist on building their toolchains in 32-bit mode. This is a big problem since it became impossible to build Chromium, uh, to link Chromium codebase with uh, only four gigabytes of memory available back in 2016. Another problem is that many toolchains lack support for any sort of advanced debugging features, so for example ASAN or TSAN. Besides that, vendor toolchains often don't support advanced <coughs> compiler optimizations like PGO or LTO. What this all means is even though some we are are aware that some of the toolchains that we have to build our code with suffer from certain problems and there are fixes for those problems, we, can actually, we cannot actually fix the problem at their source. We usually only have to make workarounds for compiler-specific bugs. Given the number of vendors and different components that they build their toolchains from, this, the, the, the number of those workarounds was actually quite significant. So, building Chromium with old GCC version might not be a pleasurable experience, but it was doable for, for us and we actually did that for a very long time. However, at a certain point in time this became impossible. Back in, if I remember correctly, 2017, Chromium decided to switch from C++11 to C++14. Then the question became, became, how do we actually build this C++14 codebase with our C++11 only toolchains? We evaluated various solutions for, this for, for those problems, but after uh, careful deliberations, we decided that none of them were actually feasible for us. So the answer is you don't do it. So what do you do instead? Instead of... Mm, trying to fix the code to actually backport, backport the code from, for example, C++14 to C++11, we decided to use our own compiler. To make it possible, however, we had to keep some certain things in mind. First, we at Vue are not compiler engineers, so we wanted to keep the, the amount of work required to make this happen to an absolute minimum. Besides that, since vendor toolchains, besides the tools often come with various libraries that allow you to use platform features. We wanted to reuse as many of those libraries as possible. Didn't want to reinvent the wheel and follow our own versions of some, comp some libraries, even though they might be open source. Another problem to consider was the fact that the, the SDK that we deliver is a shared library and our, our customers 
will, would still like to use their old and, and tried and trusted vendor toolchain to actually link against the library that we produced for them. The last um, important part was to actually to keep the amount of work needed uh, by various delivery teams to a minimum. We didn't want to burden them too much uh, with uh, this, this new setup. So, if you think about compilers and viable alternatives, there are actually only two available right now. One is the old and trusted GCC toolchain that we've been using, although at the older versions of it. And the other new, newer compiler is called Clang. So the question become, became, which one of those should we pick? Initially, my preferred candidate was to stick with GCC, but just use newer version of it. There are some differences, however, between those compilers, which actually became important for us and changed our... Uh, and actually made an impact on the final solution. So what are those differences? The first one is how both compilers handle cross-compilation. Cross-compilation is a process when we basically build code of, on machine on one of one architecture for a machine of a different one. For example, in this case, we might be building code on x86 Intel machine for ARM device. So how do both compilers handle it? To explain you this part, I would like to switch to a terminal and give you, show you some demos. So first, we have a simple SAMDOS-C example. It's a piece of C code that adds to integers. If you would like to compile it for my host machine using GCC, you will invoke it as GCC, the source file. Generate only object file since this piece of code doesn't even have a main, a main function and put the output in sum.o. So now that we have it, we can check the output file. As you can probably guess, the target, market, uh, the target architecture that this uh, is for is x86-64, since so this is my desktop machine. Now, if I would like to comp compile the same code for ARM, I would use, I will use a slightly I will have to use a slightly different version of GCC. This GCC version will be prefixed with something called GNU triple. So, for, for, so in this case, it will be ARM Linux GNU ABI HF since it's a hardware pop, it will be a hardware floating point target, and then GCC. And we can just copy paste the remaining arguments since we don't want to change them. As expected, this produced an ARM output file. Now, how to do this? The same thing with Clang. Well, to compile the code for my course host, it, the invocation will be exactly the same as GCC one, but we will replace GCC with Clang. As expected, once again, the machine, the target machine architecture is x86-64. So, how do we now compile the code for ARM? If you check my path, you won't find any ARM Linux GNU ABI HF clang in here. Still, I can build this code for ARM. What clang is, compared to GCC, is something called multi-target compiler. So, in order to build this source file for different architecture, I can specify this architecture as a command line argument. So, in this case, the, tar the command line parameter is called target, and the value it takes is the same as the prefix for the GCC toolchain that we used. If I now check the output, as, expect, as expected, we'll see that the target architecture is ARM. But this is not the only architecture that this, thing, that this Clang build can support. We can easily, for example, replace, replace <coughs> ARM with MIPS, although then we have to also get rid of this part, and as expected, this time the code will tar target MIPS architecture. But this is also not all that Clang can do. Clang can also target completely different operating systems. As you can see, the architecture is still MIPS, but the OS ABI is 
Unix FreeBSD now. So what this means, that in case of GCC, the, the target uh, architecture selection is done at compiler build time. If you'd like to build code for a different architecture, you will need a completely different compiler build. In case of Clang, however, target selection is do done at compiler runtime. You need one Clang build to target different architectures and operating systems. This, is, this will be very important for us because as in order to keep things simple, we, we will not have to build multiple versions of GCC, but we can only produce one Clang build and use it for all of our target platforms. The second part I would like to talk about is called compiler runtime. Let's once again switch to a terminal session. So this time, I would first like to explain to you, to you what a compiler runtime is. To do this, let's use a different code example this time. This is a simple application that takes two arguments, converts them to long, long values, and divides them by each other. If I <coughs> compile this code for ARM, so lldiv.c, object file, output, lldiv.o. The question is now, what functions do you expect this piece of code to call? Well, the obvious one will be, we include stdlib and we call a2ll and nothing else. So we expect to see that this piece of code will contain a main symbol and two undefined references to a2ll functions. So let's check if it's really true. Let's go and pager. So as expected, we have our main function, we have an undefined a 2 uh, function, undefined reference to a 2 function, which will be linked from a libc library. But if you take a closer look, you'd also notice that we have an undefined reference to aabi ldiv mod function. The question is, where does it come from? If you take a look at our code, you won't see it at least not immediately. This function call is actually made from this piece of code. Why, you may ask? Well, our target ARM architecture cannot actually divide two long, long values in hardware. So what GCC does for us here is it actually replaces this simple division operation by a function call. So if you check, for example, that is the disassembly of this piece of code, you will see our call to a 2 ll and finally, before returning from main function, a, K, a, a call to aabi div mode. So, okay, we know that this will actually require another library then. The question becomes, what library? Well, let's try to produce an actual executable. Let's run readelf on it and check the linked libraries. Or not lldiv.o, but lldiv this time, since it's executable. And what, <coughs> what libraries do we see there? We see the libc, since this was linked uh, for our a, a to ll, but we don't, don't see anything else. The reason for it is that GCC actually linked this extra library for us statically. We can actually see it if we instruct to link it dynamically. So now we'll actually see it. We have libgcc and libc. So what I'm, what I'm aiming he here for is that basically the tool chain <coughs> that you might get from your vendor does, does not only contain some libraries that you will link explicitly like libc, for example, libpthread, it also contains some libraries Uh, that are might, might be linked for you implicitly. How many of those libraries? How, how many are um, how many are uh, such libraries? Where well, does the libgcc, for example, the lib ssp, which might be linked for you if you enable stack smashing protector, 
There's, for example, Lip Atomic. There's, for example, if your code uses sanitizer, you might be linking against Lip Ason. If you are compiling, can compiling C++ code, the toolchain will probably link for you the Lip standard C++ library. So, what this basically means that each tool toolchain has some libraries like libc that you are probably aware of and you are linking explicitly, but also might have some libraries that, have, that will be linked for you implicitly. The question then becomes, how do you actually force your own compiler to use those libraries shipped by vendor toolchain? Well, the unfortunate answer for GCC is that you cannot actually do this easily. You could probably produce some workarounds that work for some specific version of GCC, but this usually breaks pretty quickly. Clank, on the other hand, and does support it. So the question becomes how? Let's use our LLDF example once again. Let's use Clang and let's compile the code for the ARM architecture. First, since we know already that we will be linking the uh, libc, we have to tell the Clang where to find this libc. This is usually done by something called sysroot. In our case, if you look at the vendor compiler, it will somewhere in its directory hierarchy will it will contain a CIC root directory, which will usually mirror what you can usually what you can find on your host system root. So, for example, if you check sysroot and its lib directory, you will most likely find libc in there. So, we would like to tell our, our Clang build that it should take the libc part from this directory. This is done by the um, okay, let's reuse this. This is done by the parameter called sysroot. It takes an absolute path to a directory called containing this um, mirror of the target architect, target device um, root directory hierarchy. So let's use pwd. And since we already listed directory contents here, let, let's take it. So, okay, we have this root, and let's try to build our example. Let's maybe build a final executable already. So, lldiv.c, output lldiv, right? Will it work? No, it doesn't work. didn't work because I made a mistake with copy-pasting the code. Anyway, so now that we try to successfully build, we, when, when we try to build the code, we actually see that client complains it cannot find this libgcc.s. So this is the runtime compiler runtime library that we would like to use reuse from the system, uh, the GNU uh, stbgcc toolchain. As I mentioned earlier, it's not possible to tell GCC to find a different version of uh, compiler runtime libraries, but it's actually possible to do it with Clang. In case of Clang, we have another command line parameter called GCC toolchain. Similar to syslog, it takes an absolute path to a directory containing the toolchain you'd like to use. In our case, it's just the, this stbgcc 4.8. So if you now invoke our Clang build, the Clang compiler will actually see that it successfully linked our binary. Now, the question is, can we actually verify that it uses different uh, toolchain runtime libraries? Well, let's use a different example for it. In this case, let's use C++ code. We have a simple application that will print the lib, uh, the libc++ release that it has been built against. So how to build it? Let's first use switch to clang++ since this is a C++ code. Let's leave those command arguments intact. And let's compile a different example. So cxxver output 
Oh, let's just remove the CC here. So we have our example. Can we run it? We can run it on our host using QEMU ARM. Okay, sorry, one more thing. We have to also link it statically to make it easier to run. So now we can see that this was linked against lib standard C++ release from 2015, which is more or less the time frame, uh, time frame when GCC 4.8 was released. But can we actually try to use a different uh, version of different GCC build take li runtime libraries from? Well, I have self-built GCC 5 and GCC 6 builds here. So let's try to use those. Once again, let's replace this part with GCC 5. Let's run our example. And as we can see now, it tells us that it, is, it was built against lib standard C++ from 2017. If we then replace this with GCC 6, we we'll once again see a newer version. So it basically means that with this one simple command line parameter, we can instruct Clang compiler to use a completely different GCC runtime. The last part I would like to talk, talk, you, <coughs> talk to you about is extra tools. The question is, do you need any extra tools to produce a working tool chain? Well, let's try something simple. This ARM GCC build that I used previously is the output of G only GCC build process. So the question being is, can I actually build code successfully using this tool chain? No, I can't. The question is why? Well, if you know how tool chains work, you might be aware that GCC first generates assembly code, which in each that it it then passes to an external assembler tool to actually produce a working object or, or machine code. In our case, GCC, since this is only a GCC build, it doesn't actually feature uh, any kind of assembler in its own. Since GCC doesn't have an, an own, uh, its own assembler tool, it relies on an external tool provided by Binutils project. Since it cannot find this GCB build doesn't, haven't been built together with Binutils, it actually tries to find first working assembler in my path. So this takes this assembler and tries to invoke it to build, to generate code for our architecture, triggering this error message. Clank, on the other, on, on the other hand, as we already tried, can build code for ARM architecture without an external assembler tool. Clang has an integrated as assembler. So if you try the same example once again, as we've seen in the past, it does work. But do you actually need any, addition, any other additional tools to actually produce a working tool chain? The answer is yes. You will need at least a linker, the mentioned, assembl and the mentioned assembler. In both cases, <coughs> The tools are provided, in, in cases of GCC, both tools are provided by the Newtils project, but in case of Clang, the compiler itself has an integrated assembler so it can, can produce machine code without an external tool. And if you really are curious, you, will also, so you can also see that it features its own linker called LLD. Besides that, there are other very useful tools like often used in this presentation. Redelf, there's object dump, for example, all tools, tools like object copy, uh, like AR and M NM. And in all cases, those tools in case of GCC come from external Binutils project, but on the, uh, but, but Clank on the, other, on, on the other hand, um, features, their, maybe not Clank, but LLVM features their, its own versions of those tools. So, to actually build a working GCC compiler, besides building GCC itself, you have to also build binutils, which unfortunately have this 
and which have this unfortunate feature that even though they do support multi-target mode, so you can build binutils once and then deploy it on multiple different, um, use them to process assembly for or machine code for different platforms, that unfortunately, unfortunately not all binutils tools support this multi-target mode. The biggest exception in this case is the AS tool. Clank, on the other hand, has an integrated assembler, which can be disabled if absolutely needed, has its own linker, has a replacement for all of the um, new binutils tools, and all of the tools that Clank and LLVM feature actually do work in multi-target mode. So, how do you deploy the custom compiler then? Well, in case of GCC, you would have to first build GCC for each and every uh, target architecture that you, would wish to, that you wish to support. Then you would need to at least once build, build multi-target binutils, so that tools like, for example, Redelf and Object Dump can actually process the uh, object files that your GCC build can uh, generate. Then you would have to make multiple binutils package builds for, ar for each architecture to actually have a assemble binary that works for your architecture. Then, if you really would like to reuse the, as many libraries as possible from the vendor toolchain, you have to at least try to figure out the, uh, some extra command line parameters that could, could force GCC version X to use runtime libraries from GCC version Y. And finally, you have to pray that it actually works reliably across different multiple versions, uh, GCC versions, which it doesn't. Clank, on the other hand, is quite simple. You build the LVM project once, make sure that you enable Clank and LLD sub projects. Then you need to ensure that you pass appropriate target switch to your compile units. Besides that, you might need to pass GCC toolchain switch if you would like to use runtime libraries from a specific GCC version. And that's mostly it. So, one of the last goals that we have when using custom compiler, compiler was actually to keep the amount of work needed by other teams in our uh, company to a minimum. So the question becomes, what to, to, to support our custom compiler setup, what each individual team will have to do in order to use, uh, to build uh, their, our code for their desired target platform? Well, the things is easy. The things are easy. First, you have to figure out what the GNU triple is, so basically the prefix that each GCC binary uh, shipped by the vendor uses. You take that and pa pass it to a target command line parameter when invoking Clang. Then, usually, <coughs> well, you have to find this sysroot subdirectory of, of vendor toolchain and pass a path to it to Clang via sysroot command line argument. And finally, you use this GCC toolchain parameter that we've discussed. After that, the code should just build. You don't need to build your, each team doesn't have to build its own GCC version, even though they, they might decide to, for example, target um, hardware architectures that are not officially supported by our product. Clank initially was supposed to be a temporary solution, where the, my, my, our initial plan was to basically wait until vendors upgrade their toolchains and then switch back to using the vendor toolchains in our setup. The temporary solution turned out to be so successful that we don't, uh, that we no longer have any plans of going back to using vendor toolchains uh, tool chains in our setup. It simply works too good for us to actually go back to that uh, way we actually used to uh, deal with uh, building code for our target devices. So this will end my presentation for today. And we'll soon hopefully have a short Q&A session.
Thank you, Piotr. Great presentation. Uh, now I'd like to take some questions. And I guess, you know, honestly, the, the first question is just a personal one for mine as a non-technical Mac user. I mean, is, is there a reason I should care about Clang? Um, well, Thomas, this is an interesting question. Uh, LLVM and Clang project have actually been started by Apple. Uh, Apple is still one of the main contributors and one of the companies that hires most of LLVM Clang developers. Okay. And they started it because they wanted a different compiler for their operating system, which is macOS. So nowadays, all probably all the binaries that you are using on your Mac that have been written in C or C++ have been compiled using Clang. So yes, you probably should care about it because you probably couldn't use your Mac without Clang. Well, that's an excellent, uh, excellent reason. Um, so fantastic to know. Um, At least if you're a Mac user. Yeah, <laughs> and and I am. So that that's perfect. Um, Another going to another sort of more technical question um, asked by people who know more about this than I do. Um, have you seen any performance or, or static footprint benefits from differences in optimizations when you moved from GCC to Clang? Uh, well, this is a tricky question. In our case, as I mentioned during my presentation, we actually haven't moved from an up-to-date and recent GCC version to an up-to-date and recent Clang version. So, like doing a proper comparison between those in our setup wouldn't be fair. Uh, from what I know, Clank and GCC are actually pretty uh, up-to-date versions of those comp compilers are pretty close to each other. They generate a very good code. Both are pretty good when it comes to more, both size and performance. There, you usually can find some like very specific uh, use cases when one of the compilers is faster, but it, like, it varies from a case by case. So I wouldn't say that we observed it, uh, any differences because we actually moved to Clang. We observed differences because we moved from an old and outdated GCC version to a very recent up-to-date Clang, which allowed us to enable many different optimizations that we previously couldn't. One of those, for example, is the one something that I mentioned during my presentation called LTO, so link time optimization. This actually, I don't have exact numbers on me right now, but it uh, allowed us to, for example, reduce uh, the size of our binaries by several megabytes without actually losing any performance, and in some hmm. cases, actually gaining. Some. Wow. So yes, we did observe uh, performance <laughs> benefits and size increases, tech decreases of our libraries, but it was not precisely because uh, Clank is uh, just that much better, basically, a newer version hmm. that we are using. Okay. And then, I guess, related to that, um, are there some areas, in your opinion, where GCC holds an edge uh, with respect to Clang? Well, there is one specific case that I'm aware of, uh, and it's actually the reason why I still use, uh, personally use GCC for some projects. And this basically boils down to um, an optimization called PGO, Profile Guided, Guided Optimization. And so, well, when you do a, such optimization using GCC, uh, GCC generates a profiling information uh, from your compiler. Uh, once your binary runs, it actually generates a, a specific output file, which actually contains information how was this code executed? And based on this information, the compiler can actually optimize code differently. Uh -huh. uh, where Clang and GCC differ in this uh, specific case is that uh, Clang basically takes this information and always tries to optimize the code for, for maximum performance, which is a fair thing to do. Uh, GCC, mm -hmm. on the other hand, often uh, actually tries to see how specific, specific bits of code are actually, how often they're being called. So there are parts of the code base that are like, uh, known as being called. So they are, for example, run only once when you start your application, but afterwards they are never touched on anymore. And there are parts of code that are being hot, so something that gets called very often. So GCC, okay. for example, often tries to optimize the code that is hot, so called often, mm -hmm. uh, in, for performance. And the parts that are like called only once or called very rarely, optimize them for size. So the end result is that in some cases, GCC can produce uh, binaries that are similar in performance, but are a bit smaller. So, but this is a very mm -hmm. like specific use case, and there is a chance mm -hmm. that Clank will actually employ this optimization in the future. Since I actually seen uh, tasks in upstream Clank, Bugzilla, that mentioned that it would be nice to have such features. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, that was a, that was a great uh, answer, actually, for even my non-technical uh, background. So, thanks for that. Um, I'm You're checking welcome. real quick if we have other questions coming in from the chat, um, and I don't, I don't see that we do. So I think at this point, I'd like to simply say thank you 
Piotr, for uh, yeah, for your time and your questions. And I believe, uh, without further ado, that concludes you know our talk on Clang. So thank you again to Peter. Coming up next, uh, you don't want to miss this one. It's going to be great. It's technical aspects of building a device certification platform. It's beginning right here at noon on Vue.dev. See you then. Welcome back to Vue.dev. Although certification platforms are strongly bound to the product to be certified, there are some general issues when working with certifications regardless of the scope. In this talk, Vue developer Pyotr Monjek walks through some of the experiences and lessons learned as we built our own certification platform, Vue Certify. As always, please ask your questions in the chat and we'll answer them after the session. Now. Over to you, Piotr. Hi, thank you for coming to my presentation about technical aspect of building the certification platform. My name is Piotr, I'm developer in test at Vue Software, and today I'll be talking about topic of certification and the tools, platform services that aim to help with that, based on our experiences with building the Vue Certify for devices. Let's take a look at the presentation plan. I've divided my presentation into four parts. First, we are going to talk about what we mean by certification in Vue and why we do it. Then, we'll take a look at certification process itself. Next, we are going to dip a little bit into the essence of certification, test cases themselves and common issues that happen during certification platform development. And lastly, I'd like to take a quick look into the certification results, presentation of them and how important they are. So, let's start with answering the question. What is certification in Vue? Why we do it? On what basis? And essentially, who does what in the process? In, in Vue, the main certification tool is Vue Certify for Devices platform. By the definition coined by Vue, VCD, Vue Certify for Devices, is certification program mandated for all customers shipping devices with our SDK. The VCD contains specification for devices that has a list of functional requirements and certification test suite, automated and semi-manual tests, that will verify if device satisfies those requirements. VCD tests should be performed early in early stage of the project in order to identify platform issues and fix them before the golden phase. VCD tests are to make sure that customers' devices are OTT future-proof and compliant with the relevant Tier 1 services. It also aims to save costs over a maintenance and support lifecycle per platform. During this presentation, I will be talking mainly about our own experiences gained during VCD development and refactoring. I've been talking about the tool. Now let's answer what do we mean by the certification itself. In a very high level take, by certification, we mean checking the compliance of our product, our SDK, integrated onto customer platform with industry standards, mainly related to video, but, but also on browser-specific aspects, such, such as navigation, HTML rendering, performance, etc. In very basic take, you can imagine VCD as huge test suite with big number of automated test cases designed for, for browsers, our browser, actually. On the previous slide, I have mentioned standards. This is extremely important aspect of every certification. In case of unit or, or integration tests, the case is clear. Given functionality works or not, it's easy to verify, easy to design test case around it. In case of certification, every test case must have basis on industry accepted standards. Otherwise, it would be very easy to contest the, the certification result by stakeholders. Of course, I didn't, uh, individual certificates can base on individual agreements across parties, but it's good to assume that all those arrangements will base on industry standards one way or another. So, what do we certify then? Our product integrated by our clients on their platforms. Why? To ensure that our product works with customer product without issues as intended. 
in generic way, you can think of it as verifying the product, any product really, compliance with some agreed standards agreements. Let's now take a look on how the certification can look based on the BCD example. Let's say it, it goes like that. We deliver our product to customer. Let's say it's, it's internet browser for smart TV. Then customer integrated our product, FDK, on their platform, some kind of smart TV. Next, on this integrated setup, the customer can run certification process, our VCD. After the testing is done, both we and, and customer can see the results of test cases and if the run can be qualified as certified or not. If not, of course, there is a round of bug fixing and recertifying. This is how it very basically looks like. This is how any, how any certification can look like, really. Now, when we design and develop certification platform, we have to answer a lot of, a lot of design questions, as in case in, of any tool, really. In view, during the process of VCD development, we had to answer, among others, to these basic issues, to these basic questions. How to differentiate certification trends? How to differentiate our customers, not only their personal accounts, of course, but the companies the users belong to? How to differentiate the, 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 the project that we do for our customers? Like, one customer can, of course, have multiple projects, and in those projects, we can have multiple devices that we develop our product for, and we want to separate certifications for each device. For those very basic problems, very basic questions, let's say those are our warm-up warm issues, there are some are also very basic solutions. Like, for of course, every run has to be identified by a unique ID. Every customer personal account is connected with our internal authentication service, so we can see who belongs to which company, and then the, by extensions of the, 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 the run is identified by, by the customer and by the company it belongs to. Projects and devices are, for example, kind of metadata that, it's, that describes the, the, the uh, test run. So as we can see, the thing that first comes to mind is that on base of the certification platform, we need to store the data somehow. Database, rational or not, it's not that important. It's implementation of detail. What is important is the fact that the data must be able to answer the question needed by business side. So, for example, in view, we have to know that project X from client Y passed certification on device Z with run ID N. Quick takeaway is that when designing certification platform, we need to know what question we need to answer with our certification. This may vary depending on product and industry specificity. So the granularity of data may also be adjusted in the process. Keeping that overview or our VCD model in mind, let's go over to the essence of certification, the test cases themselves. As I have mentioned, mentioned on one of the first slides, on the base of certifications, there are standards. Every test case is kind of result or consequence of points made in standards and specifications that we agree to use. This is actually quite simple blueprint for test case. Additionally, using standards as base simplifies the aspect of dividing the certification into test suites. You can easily split the test cases to separate suites for every standard specification separately. There is kind of nuance with basic on standard. There are some keywords that define conditionality of every requirement or functionality, like most, shall, should. It's good to keep in mind and uh, build in that conditionality into the test cases, optional required. There is a room for individual agreements here. For example, if specification says that something should happen, but both parties know that it must happen for given functionality, for given environment, to be supported, to be fully supported, then the optional test case can be required. We do something like that in VCD. Staying on the same topic, let's consider implementation of this. When developing and refactoring the VCD, we have considered two options. First one, 
In the test cases database, we have just test cases with metadata. After the run, the, the certification run is finished. And during the certification results generation, I, I'll say more about results later, the backend compares the test case metadata with the test run metadata and marks whether for given test run, the test case were optional or required. In a raw results database, the results are, are, kept, are kept in clean state without any conditionality specified. Just result pass or fail and, and, and that's all. And of course, all metadata that is needed to determine the, the status. In second approach, every test case in database has conditionality specified as consequence of standards. So when we develop the test case, when we specify in database, we on all sort of metadata, we also include the conditionality of this test case. The test harness during runtime can change the conditionality based on the metadata or even skip optional test cases. In a raw results database, the results are kept with conditionality specified. So it's like unchangeable. It's like the given result. In reality, it's detailed. It's, it's not really groundbreaking for the whole certification platform. Only some edge cases can probably decide which approach is better. From our experiences, we can say that first approach gives us a little bit more flexibility in tooling around the results. It happens that concepts of what's required and what's not change during the project. So it's easier to tweak conditionality of test cases for finished or, or for past test runs. In second approach, it's of course, it's of course also doable, but, but it's less flexible. Next aspect of test cases, version. As specifications are updated or new specifications are made, the certification platform must evolve to keep up the newest standard. Hence, the test cases may need to be updated. How to implement that? In view, we have considered two options. First one, version control system. For example, Git or SVN for more adventurous. General, the point is that in VCD, all the test cases are essentially JavaScript files. We keep the test suite and the test cases versions or on Git branches. When the client requests given version or of test case or test suite in their certification test run, the backend will do in-memory checkout on the repository and serve the file from, requests, from requested versions. It's quite simple. The second approach, even simpler, is just a file repository. We map the specification versions to test suite versions and then split test suite versions in directories. Then we just handle the version request with pathing for serving files. Choosing the implementations here, of course, depends on test cases specificity. How many we have, how many we know we will have, how they change, etc. It's also good to keep in mind is of the debugging. Someone will have to take a look into test cases code very often, so it's good to make easy for, for them for fixing and, and, and for development. Another aspect, test cases isolation. In case of Vue and in many others, of course, it's very important to not let the one test case interfere with another. We can set, for example, to have multiple video elements in DOM, for example, hanging there for, from previous test cases if the test does not expect the state, the that state, of course. Because of that, we need test cases isolation me mechanism. In every test run, we can have more than 1,000 of them, and every single one must be fully independent. One idea was, was simple DOM manipulation. We remove and create diffs and other HTML elements as we need, while still being in the same DOM, in the same page, and run the test functions based on fresh elements created or removed. Second approach was to load fresh DOM, fresh endpoint, essentially for each test case. That's it. Every test case is just a new endpoint, new web page. It's easy to imagine that first approach is much faster. We don't waste time on reloading the page every, every test. But the specification of our product makes the trade-off worth it, especially for DRM test cases where many things happen, let's say, under the hood. And this made that after a factor we choose 
second approach and traded execution time for re reliability. Let's go to the last aspect of test cases for this presentation, test harness, the piece of software, the library that essentially handles all actions to test executions, files reporting, passes reporting, logging, and all similar stuff. The first, most obvious approach was to use existing tools. First choice was to start with QUnit, which is one of the most popular and, and very good library for JavaScript testing. As our browser features, tests are written in JavaScript, of course, the, the QUnit was kind of obvious choice. After some time, however, we came to the conclusion that we do not use, we, we do not need like 90% of features that QUnit offers. When refactoring, we decided that we are going to rewrite the test harness with keeping only features that are essentially, that, that, that are essential for our tests. And basically, we left only with execution status reporting, logging, and test case loading. That's all what we needed. Of course, your millage may, may vary in, in, in your project. Anyway, it's, it's crucial, it's good to assess on the stage of test case design before development how much and which features you will be needing from your test harness and choose the solution based on that. Sometimes less is more, especially when it comes to code. So, we have the test cases now, it would be good to present the results of tests somehow. This is actually what is most interesting for the actual users and users of certification platform, which is the business. Let's take a very quick look at that. In the VCD, we keep raw results data in relational database. Backend of course processes these results, uh, selecting given run for given customer on given device and so on. Access for results are granted for viewed engineers and, and, uh, and, and for customers. Of course, in that case, the customers will only see their results or, or the company they belong to or even only to their project. It's good to keep in mind features like exporting the results to common formats. It facilitates work for either customers that like to have nice PDF reports and for us. If you work for with some test management tools like X-Ray, it's, it's good to have some common format that you can export and map certification results to, to test run results, for example. In that. The visual aspect of presentation is also, of course, very important. On the one hand, the customer will want to know how good the integration, the, the cooperation went. On the other hand, the fine data granularity makes it easier to eventually debug and fix any raised issues during the certifications. It's good to include things like fail logs for every failed step, for, for, for example. So let's try to quickly wrap up what we were talking about in, in today's presentation. Basing on our VCD development experiences, we can share a few aspects of building and maintaining the certification platform that we believe are crucial. First of all, take into account what you will base your certification on. Specifications, standards, documents, and other agreements that may be useful. It's also important to know how the certification will be conducted, whether it is done by client or by us, or and, and on what kind of devices we will be will the certification be conducted. This this aspect determines the next important point, which is how we implement the certification test cases, how we version them, how we isolate them, how we design the test harness. It's also important to know how, how we want to process and present the certification results so they are readable and informative for all parties, for business, for engineers, for testers. And last but not least, aspect from the other side, debugging feasibility. The platform will for sure have to be constantly maintained. The test cases will have to be added and or fixed. Let's make it easy for developers and reduce the time and cost of maintenance of the whole platform. All right, so that, that would be it. Thank you very much for being here. If you have any questions or maybe suggestions or ideas, please share them on the Q&A sessions in a few minutes.
Thank you, Piotr. Now let's go to some questions. And I think first question um, is, is really just for the viewers right now who aren't familiar with the embedded landscape. Why do companies want to certify a device? Generally, the certification is needed in every case when you have uh, when you have, when you provide your software to to customer, and the customer intends to integrate or, or run your software on device or on environment that you do not control. So you would like before the release is finished, you you would like to know that that your software is integrated in in manner that allows your software to, to run as intended. So I think mm. that certification is, is important or, or, or needed in every case. When you, when you ship software on, uh, and you know that it will be run on some configurations that you do not really control, but you know it, it, mm -hmm. it, it will run. Excellent. That's a great explanation, I think, for, for some of the viewers who, who are just kind of coming into the embedded space. So thanks for that. Um, another question around test case versioning. Why are there issues around uh, test case versioning? And can't you just add you know, more test cases to the test suites? Yeah, usually when you have um, test suites and, and you um, get more test cases which test more features, you just add them. You, you, you can have various uh, various versions of test suites that are versioned and the new version can have only um, newer test cases in compared to, mm. to the previous but there are cases when the test case are uh, when the test cases are testing the same stuff but in different manner for example we had this uh, encrypted media extensions uh, mm -hmm. test cases which in, uh, in, in in time of our product development, the API changed. Mm. So for the old versions of SDK and, and BCD, we had test cases that tested the same thing, like in newer, but in different way, because the API deep down changed. So sometimes there is a case when you modify code of a test case that tests the same thing, but in different manner. And you would still want to have a comparison between old versions and new new versions. That's why it, it, it may be important to, to version them. But sometimes you can have a product that don't need such changes. So, so you can just append new, newer and newer test cases. So it all boils down to your use case or business case. Excellent. And and actually, I guess uh, a question uh, that is, is quite interesting to me is, uh, should the certification platform also serve, or can it serve as an internal testing tool? Yeah, actually, the VCD, the, the Vue Certify, started as an internal testing tool. We, in, in Vue, we had a lot of um, test cases spread across various services. So we decided to, to bundle them up in, in one big tool that would allow our testers and QAs to, to test our SDK before release in, in some kind of consistent manner. And it turned out to be so good that we decided to go to our customers with it. So we said, hey, you can test our SDK on, on our test suite if, if you would like. So, so we can check how, how the engineering is going. And, and then we decided that it's proven good enough so we can base some kind of certification, our certification on on it, yeah. Hmm. And I guess you said a, a large number. I just curious, how many test cases are, are there in Vue to certify? For now, I think we are going. We are hitting near two thousand of test cases. We are around one thousand and six hundred and, and and counting up. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that's an impressive uh, number. Um, I'm taking a look now at the chat to see if we have any new questions that have come in but i don't see any new questions here so i think you know at that point i just want to say thank you Piotr, for a great talk about uh viewed certify and certification platforms in general thank you thomas thanks to all viewers let's go cheers and now everyone that concludes uh the talk with Piotr, and it's also our final session for viewed.dev 2021 we hope you enjoyed it. We really enjoyed ourselves putting together all of these sessions and sharing just some of what we've learned over the past 17 years.
Sorry, we had a, a little technical issue uh, at the end there. So I just wanted to say that uh, you know this was the final session of Viewed.dev 2021. We hope you enjoyed all of the sessions. We really enjoyed putting it together and sharing a little bit of what we've learned over the past 17 years of building OTT software. If you like what you've seen, take a look at our jobs page at Viewed.com. Maybe you'll be on the stage at the next Viewed.dev. From everyone here at Viewed, thanks for joining us for Viewed.dev. We'll see you again next year.